Okay, so we can continue with the midwifery session today. And with the midwifery session, uh, you need to also make sure that you go through uh, the previous session we did on antenatal booking, uh, uh, on uh, antenatal care rather. So when it comes to antenatal care, we looked at uh, the first portion. Uh, be sure to go through the previous uh, lesson. Uh, we looked at some um, aims of antenatal care. We looked at some of the World Health Organization focused on antenatal care model. And we went on to look at some components of antenatal care. So today now, we are going to focus and look at the activities that are, that are done during antenatal visit. So the first activity that is done is of course registration and booking. So during registration and booking, this is mainly done when the woman first reports for antenatal care services. And at this particular moment, this woman has to be registered for the purpose of record keeping and documentation. So that is the only thing that is done on the visit, of course. Then apart from that, the next heading uh, is, of course, history taking, which is done during an uh, antenatal visit. So on history taking, on this particular case, you need to do all the history about this particular woman during antenatal booking. So at this particular time, the nurse or the midwife now gets to know the client well. It means that you need to assess all the health-related um, conditions or you find out about the health-related condition that might, uh, that might affect the woman or the childbearing itself. So with history taking, among us, the components of history taking that you are supposed to look at is, of course, social history social or personal history now when it comes to social or personal history here you of course ask the name of the client so for identification purposes as well as just uh, building the next patient uh, relationship you find out the name then from there you also move on to ask the age of the client that you're dealing with and uh, of course having in mind that uh, childbearing age a uh, suitable age is, of course, it could be uh, between 15 and 45. And uh, we, we all understand to say, of course, mothers who are less than 18 years, as well as above 35 years, are prone to a quiet number of uh, uh, risks related to pregnancy. So you find out the age so that uh, you know the type of uh, or the age of the woman that you are dealing with. From there, you need to ask, of course, the marital status, and this helps you understand whether this woman is uh, single or married, and whether this pregnancy, of course, was planned for or not planned for, because mostly when you look at an individual who's single, majority, I'm not saying, I'm not saying all the cases, majority of the pregnancies may, may be unplanned. And then, of course, uh, this will also help this will also help you give uh, proper care to the mother as well as the baby after delivery. Apart from that, you need to find out about the residential address or the contact details, uh, where she's coming from. You find out about that information and this is uh, good, especially for follow-ups. You need to also find out about the religion because religion differs. There may be restrictions in medication. It could be foods as well, restriction, um, and other uh, aspect of life that may end up affecting the health or the pregnancy of the woman. Apart from that, you need to ask about the occupation of the uh, woman, of course. You want to, of course, know after to, to, to assist uh, uh, in this particular case, we want to make sure that you assist the mother and the baby uh, willfully or fully. Therefore, you must identify what this particular woman do for a living and the risks associated with the type of work that this particular woman do. Maybe this woman may be working in an industry where there, uh, there is uh, too much exposure to radiation and you know that radiation is not good for a pregnant woman or exposure to any irritant or ionizing agents so yeah that's why most you ask for occupation 
Apart from occupation on the same social or personal history, you need to ask about the education level and this also helps enhance communication. Apart from that, also helps give IEC um, uh, programs or interventions in the language that this woman will best understand. Then apart from that, you also find out about their traditional beliefs because some traditional beliefs may restrict foods which may end up affecting development of the fetus. Apart from that, uh, it could be also certain traditional beliefs uh, that are practiced may end up uh, endangering the, the unborn child or the woman themselves. Then apart from that on social history, of course, you may also find out other issues like hobbies. It could be social habits that this patient, uh, this patient, person rather, is engaged with. And among the social habits, uh, you look at the eating habits. Do, are, are they having pica? Uh, then apart from that, it could be do they drink alcohol? Are they uh, excessively drinking alcohol? Because this may uh, affect the child or the fetus or the development of the fetus. Then apart from that, you also, of course, uh, ask whether this woman smokes and you know the risks uh, that goes with smoking. This may result in intrauterine growth retardation amongst other risks. Then of course, apart from that, you can also ask about the next of kin or the husband. And in terms of the husband and the next of kin, you ask, of course, their name, the occupation as well, what they do for a living, their social habits, smoking or excessive alcohol intake, because sometimes it could be this husband smokes and this pregnant woman may become a passive smoker within the house. And then this ends up affecting uh, the unborn child. So in terms of social history, those are some of the information that you need to uh, record. Then apart from social history, the other type of history that is supposed to be collected is of course environmental history. So in terms of environmental history, you need to find out in terms of accommodation, the number of windows, uh, is there good ventilation and how many are there in this particular house. Uh, apart from that, it could be also source of water. You find out in terms of environmental history because sometimes the source of water may predispose this woman to diarrhea uh, diseases apart from that the type of toilets uh, how they dispose of their waste the surrounding uh, the lighting system within their surrounding so those are some of the information that you find out on social history apart from social history so apart from social history you also need to find out about the family medical history so with the family medical history here, you want to know any genetic predisposition that this particular pregnant woman may be exposed to so that you are able to anticipate any of uh, a genetic predisposition or condition that may be running in the family. So among us, the family medical history uh, information that you find out, you find out about whether there is diabetes that is running in the family or anyone who's diabetic, or if the mother themselves, they are diabetic, you find out in terms of uh, asthma, whether there's someone who has asthma in the family, or if the mother themselves have asthma. Apart from that, you get information related to sickle cell, whether the mother is a sickler or not, or anyone in the family. Then you find out about hypertension as well, uh, mental illnesses such as psychosis, epilepsy, you can find out about tuberculosis or twin as well as multiple pregnancy. This is also very, uh, uh, very cardinal. So these are some of the information that you may find out in terms of the past medical history. Then apart from past medical history, you can also find out about, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, family medical history. You can also try to find out about uh, personal uh, medical history. So in terms of personal medical history, what are information that you find out from this particular woman? Here most you try to assist in ascertaining or having knowledge about the previous health status of the pregnant woman. And in addition, you also look at um, the conditions outlined in the family history. 
the pregnant woman is asked about maybe history of uh, sexually transmitted infections, UTIs, hepatitis, and many others among other uh, uh, past, I mean, among other family medical uh, history conditions that we had talked about. Then, of course, apart from personal medical history, you also try to find out about the surgical history. So you mainly ask the woman if she has had any injuries or operations, especially those involving the pelvic bones, the spinal, the lower limbs. Uh, and then apart from that, uh, you, you assess for this because these injuries may mainly alter the diameter of the pelvis and this may alter the angle and affect uh, uh, the child during birth where the child fails to come out because the angle is small uh, in situations such as cephalopelvic uh, disproportion. Then apart from that, you also ask if the woman has had any abdominal surgeries because this may affect uh, uh, this particular pregnancy. And if, of course, the woman had any abdominal surgery, be it a cesarean section, it means that you need to find out what caused or what resulted in this particular woman experiencing this particular abdominal surgery. Then, of course, you need to find out about uh, the obstetric history itself. So with obstetric history, you, of course, uh, get past obstetric history. And in past obstetric history, you are trying to look at uh, the, the past history on childbearing. And this helps to predict the likely outcome of the current pregnancy. Then apart from that, uh, you, you mainly get information on past medical history, such as the number of previous pregnancies, which is the gravida the children themselves, which is parity, health status of the children, year of birth, weight of the babies at birth. Uh, you also find out whether the children uh, were alive at, uh, or dead, or they are dead, and if they are dead, what was the cause of the death, and at what age did this particular child die. Then apart from that, you look at the type and duration of feeding as well. You also ask about the health of the mother during that particular previous yeah, pregnancy. You also look at the modern type of delivery. How did they deliver in their previous pregnancy? Was it a, a, a mature um, a baby or was it a premature or was it a post-mature or it, was it a spontaneous vaginal delivery or was it induced? So you are trying to find out the mode uh, as well as type of delivery. Or was it instrument delivery? So all this information, you 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 find you ask it under obstetric history, and you fill it in the form, of course. Then apart from that, you also find out the duration of labor, any complications experienced in that particular previous pregnancy. Then of course, you also under the same obstetric history, you also find out about the menstrual as well as contraceptive history. Here you mostly look at uh, you ask in terms of uh, the age of um, uh, the age at menac of course the type of cycle cycle do they have a regular uh, irregular cycle what's their duration does it exceed the uh, minimum of five days or not or apart from that uh, the flow itself is it reduced is it just normal or is it always heavy. Then apart from that, you also ask about any method of contraception, when and of course how long and the reasons for stopping uh, since this particular woman is pregnant now. Then apart from that, you also now find out or get information about the present obstetric history. And with the present obstetric history, the first thing that you ask is of course the last menstrual period. So with the last menstrual period, you find that this history can also help you calculate uh, the expected date of uh, delivery as well as also the gestational age because you now have the LMP. Then, uh, of course, in terms of uh, the LMP, an example I can give, of course, on LMP, we can say uh, maybe the woman's LMP was, um, the, was 20th. Then uh, 02, which is February, then 20, uh, 2023. So if we are to calculate the LMP, 
you add seven days, uh, seven to the days. This is because we have seven days in a week. And you're going to add nine to the months because a normal pregnancy can run up to nine months. It means that in this particular case, the expected date of delivery is going to be 27th, uh, 09, which is September 2023. It means that you would, you would have calculated the expected date of delivery. So that is how you calculate the EDD. So the EDD needs to come out as well as you get or collect uh, the present uh, obstetric history. And then, of course, when it comes to calculating the uh, the gestational age, gestational age, you need to calculate. Um, uh, you, you need to calculate or count how many weeks have passed from the date of the LMP to the day that you are assessing this woman. So you count in February, since this woman's LMP is in February, you count how many uh, uh, weeks are in February that we can count if it's one week or two weeks. You count, you come to March, you count the weeks that are there and you keep the remainder of the days until you count all the weeks until the date today. And if you are going to get 28 weeks, it means that your gestational age it means that the number of weeks that has passed from the last menstrual period to the day that you are assessing this woman, you will say it is 28 weeks. And that is what is known as gestational age. So apart from obstetric history, the other information that you collect on history during the, the first antenatal visit is dietary history. And on dietary history, you mainly ask what type of food this particular woman likes, the number of meals per day, uh, eating of non-foods. Do they eat non-foods like soil? Uh, this can help so that you can give appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate uh, IEC. Then apart from that, of course, you get also medication history. And on medication history, you ask the woman if she's on any long-term uh, medications for example any antiretroviral treatment or therapy antihypertensive or anti-malarial it, it could be anti-diabetic drugs so you ask uh, the woman <clears throat> about their medication history if they take any drugs so basically on history taking that is the information that you collect so from history taking, the next aspect that you do, uh, the next activity that is done during uh, the first visit, of course, is physical examination. Now, during physical examination, of course, you look at what is termed as general examination and specific examination. So under general examination, uh, here most you uh, it is uh, done before a full physical examination meaning before a specific examination you do what is known as just a general examination so what are the things that you look at on a general examination the first thing you look at the general appearance of this woman how is she appearing how is the grooming just generally on the external then apart from that you look at the impression of the physical and mental well-being is this particular patient a woman rather mentally stable or not mentally stable you look at the stature of the woman is this woman small uh, or is this woman uh, having a normal uh, stature because normally a small bodied woman may have a small pelvis you look at the gait of the woman as well is she able to walk normally or uh, are there any deformities or limping that you're able to see or is there stunted growth uh, because this may also help or in, uh, help uh, identify to say there may be cephalopelvic uh, disproportions and this may result in um, a small pelvis or an altered uh, diameter of the pelvis so apart from that on general examination you just also look at the posture of the woman uh, the, the post, how is she able to, to, to present when she stands? Is she bending backward or just moving normally? Then apart from that, you look at the height of the woman. 
is the height of the woman at least a minimum of 150 centimeters or is it small because if this woman is too short it may mean that this woman may have uh, a smaller pelvis or apart from that on height you also look at the shoe size of the woman is the woman able to wear or put on a shoe size of more than size 3 or less because again if this woman is able to put on on a shoe size less than 3 it may mean that this woman um, may have a small or abnormal pelvis then apart from that you look at the weight of the woman uh, because this weight of the woman is very important because on average this woman may gain about 12 kg and uh, on average this woman may gain about 2 kg in the first 20 weeks of gestation and uh, probably they may be gaining 0.5 kg per week until term of course so uh, normally in the hospital you need to make sure that uh, the weight is taken each time this woman comes for antenatal care visits then apart from that of course on general examination also you need to check the vital signs and of course the vital signs are also recorded each time this particular woman visits the facility you check the blood pressure of course the temperature pulse respirations as well also urinalysis is also done so in terms of general examination those are the aspects that are focused on then from there of course now you, you are able to do now a full physical examination so on a full physical examination this is done from head to toe and on this particular case in terms of the head you of course look at the hair of the woman uh, you look for signs of undernourished air, hair you look at uh, whether this woman's hair is brown or brittle this may indicate uh, either chronic tb or hiv apart from that in terms of the face you are looking at whether this woman uh, has a swollen face meaning is there edema what is their facial expression apart from that do they have anxiety are they happy or do they are they apprehensive you look at the health status of the skin of the face as well is it dry is it moist or they are they having a normal skin texture of the face in terms of the eyes as well you look at the eyes is there pallor that you're able to notice from there is there jaundice that you're able to notice from sclera of the eyes uh, is there eye discharge is there cyanosis or bluish discoloration of the um of the eyes so those are the things you look at the eyes in terms of the nose as well you examine whether there is any polyps or growths discharge or bleeding or are they having any breathlessness you look at the ears whether there is any polyps or growths or any discharge that is coming out there you look at the mouth as well uh, in terms of the mouth you look at where there is signs of anemia and by signs of anemia you're looking at the lips whether they are dry or bluish the mucous membranes of the mouth as well they are focused on the tongue inclusive you look at also whether this woman has any oral infections or oral thrush or sores or dent dental car uh, car caries uh, apart from that if uh, there is halitosis or acetone smell so in the mouth yeah examining all these things that i'm mentioning so from the mouth you move on to the neck and on the neck you are palpating for enlargement of um, probably the, the 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 glands themselves the cervical glands you look at whether they are enlarged or they are having the normal size you you from there you move on to the hands and you, uh, with the hands of course you start by examining the furthest hands for signs of anemia in the palms uh, whether there is uh, poor venous return apart from that uh, you also assess other areas uh, such as you examine for signs of edema you ask the woman to also make a fist and uh, apart from that you assess whether there is uh, any uh, awkward edema or edema or once the patient makes the fist are they are you able to see the knuckles the separation of the fingers so you assess all those you look at the, uh, the fingers themselves or the nails. Is there a clubbing of the nails? Uh, you look at cyanosis, of course. So all these you assess. And amongst others, you also assess the symmetrical of the hands. 
So apart from the hands, also you need to inspect the armpits or the axilla. You inspect first of all for cleanliness and you also palpate for enlargement of the lymph nodes. Because if the lymph nodes in the axilla or armpits are enlarged or inflamed, this may indicate breast infection or chest infection or some certain chronic chest illnesses. So from the armpits, you now move on to the breast. So for the breast, you are mainly examining the breast or inspecting the breast first of all for the size. Are they having the normal size? Are they having the normal shape? Uh, you look at the nipple. Is the nipple retracted or dimpling? Or is there a rash or so that you're able to see? Is there any nipple discharge? Is there a presence of scars? So you assess all those for uh, on the breast of the of the of the mother of course you also look at the darkening of the areola itself uh, apart from that you also examine uh, the breast for their suitability to breastfeed because sometimes this particular woman may have breast but they have no signs of producing uh, breast milk or colostrum then apart from that you need also to palpate the breast themselves for any presence of lump or abnormalities so from the breast, you can also, of course, assess uh, the abdomen and apart and on the abdomen. Uh, so we can talk about the lower limbs and we can finish up with the abdomen. So in terms of the lower limbs, you check for any physical disabilities, of course, the symmetry of the legs. You look at the size of the foot. You examine the legs for signs of anemia. You also examine uh, the for signs of uh, tibia or pedo or ankle edema because this will help you rule out uh, complications such as pre uh, eclampsia you also look at or assess for any uh, i mean palpate for any presence of deep vein uh, thrombosis okay then from there now we can talk about the abdomen so in terms of the abdomen what things are you looking out for or checking during the antenatal visit the first thing uh, when it comes to uh, abdominal examination, you want to confirm pregnancy, of course. You want to assess the presentation and the lie of the fetus. You also want to look at the, to, to assess the fetal well-being itself. Now, in this particular case, uh, with the abdominal, physical examination of the abdomen, you are mainly inspecting, palpating as well as the auscultating. So on inspection, what are you looking out for? The first thing you look at uh, for the is, uh, contour of the abdomen itself. Uh, is it heavy? Is it round in shape? Uh, is it oval? Is it irregular? Or it, does it have any abnormal shape? But of course, you expect to see the oval shape if this is the normal pregnancy. Then you look at the size as well. Is it big or is it small? And as well, is it corresponding? Uh, to the gestational age and in terms of the skin uh, just on inspection for the skin itself you are looking for the linear nigra the dark line of pigmentation that develops when someone is pregnant you also look at the stri gravidarum, and the stri gravidarum, uh, these are just uh, silvery uh, stripes which may suggest a previous pregnancy uh, and uh, when you look at uh, pink stri uh, stripes, this suggests a present uh, pregnancy. So if you see that the silvery or grayish lines are there or stretch marks are the ones that are there, it just indicates a previous uh, pregnancy. But when you see the pink ones, pink stretch marks, which are known as trigravidarum, this may suggest current pregnancy. Then, of course, you also look out for the scar. If, uh, if this woman underwent any operation, uh, you look out for any skin lesion. You look out also for fetal movement. Is there evidence that the fetal is still uh, viable if, of course, this pregnancy has uh, progressed with some uh, weeks? Then from there now, you move on to palpation from inspection. So on palpation, what are you looking out for? The first thing you check for the height of fundus. So you check for the height of fundus, of course, to determine how old the pregnancy is. And this mostly co corresponds with the gestational age. So here, you, this is where now you use uh, the tape measure. 
and your landmarks are mainly the symphysis pubis, the umbilicus or xiphoid uh, sternum you palpate so that you feel for the resistance of the, uh, of the uterus and then you measure with the tape measure. If you get 32 centimeters, this may indicate that it could be this woman has a gestational age of um, 32 weeks, uh, which could be plus uh, 2 or minus 2. Of course, when you look at uh, the gestational age of between 12 to 20 weeks gestation, you expect to find the fundus to rise about uh, two fingers uh, every two weeks from, uh, from there. Then apart from that, uh, you expect that after 20 weeks, the fundus rises above uh, one finger. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the breath every two weeks. But uh, of course, by 12 weeks, the, the fundus is just uh, right above the symphysis pubis. And of course, by 16 weeks, it's halfway between the upper board of the symphysis pubis and the lower board of the umbilicus. And from there, you can even experience quickening. Quickening is also known as a first fetal movement. At this particular moment, it can be felt by the... Uh, by the mother. And then of course by 20 weeks uh, it is mostly at the lower board of the symphysis pubis and uh, the fetal movements can even be felt at this moment during palpation. By 22 weeks you expect the fundal height to be somewhere at the level of the umbilicus. By 24 weeks you expect it to be just at the upper border of the umbilicus and by 30 weeks it should be somewhere halfway between the upper border of the umbilicus and um, uh, so it should be somewhere between the upper border of the uh, of the umbilicus and uh, to the lower border of the xiphoid uh, sternum. Then of course by 36 weeks you expect it to be somewhere just at the lower border of the xiphoid sternum and somewhere from 38 weeks to onset of labor you expect at this particular moment the cervix to, to ripen. Apart from that, there is also partial effacement of the, cervix, uh, of the cervix itself. And this causes the presenting part of the baby to also descend. And when you look at the height of fundus, it drops at this particular moment about two fingers breadth. Uh, then apart from that, uh, when you see this, this is what is also known as the lightening then it also usually takes uh, place when you, for lightening it also usually takes place in in prime gravida but it also may occur in multigravida with tight abdominal muscles or, 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 of course then apart from um, that you also need to do what is known as uh, fundal palpation lateral palpation and also pelvic palpation so in terms of fundal palpation you want to determine the lie as well as the pre presentation of the fetus. Then with lateral palpation, you want to determine the lie as well as the attitude and position. Then with deep pelvic palpation, you want to determine the presentation. Uh, is there engagement? You also want to rule out cephalopelvic disproportion. Um, uh, of course, uh, you want to also check if the head has descended. So this is what you are assessing on fundal, lateral, or deep uh, pelvic palpation. Then from there, of course, you now need to auscultate. And during auscultation, you want to feel for the fetal heart rate for a minute. And as you auscultate, you want to get the rhythm as well as the regularity of the, uh, of the heartbeat. Apart from that, you also want to get the actual fetal heart rate. Is it between 120 to 160 beats per minute, which is normal? And of course, you expect to feel the fetal heart rate at least uh, after 20th week of gestation. So from there now, you also need to inspect the vulva. And on the vulva, uh, that is the last portion that you do on physical examination. On the vulva, you inspect it for any discharge. Is there bleeding? Is there edema? Is there sores? Are there warts? Are there varicose veins, perineal scars? or any congenital abnormalities uh, that you can see. 
So once you assess all those things, it means that you are done with physical examination. And from physical examination, we can talk about some of the common investigations that can be done. And amongst the investigations, you can do urine analysis. You check whether there's proteins, glucose, or acetone to rule out certain common uh, uh, conditions that may affect uh, pregnancy. You look out, of course, um, you do some blood tests. You do maybe a plasma, rapid plasma reagent, RPR. You can check for HIV, hemoglobin levels. And the normal values are that it should be at least the minimum should be about 11.5 grams per deciliter or more uh, in a woman who's pregnant in terms of the HB. Then you also, you may need to assess for resus, uh, the resus factor. Uh, you can check for blood grouping and cross match. You can do RDT. Uh, you can get uh, also, uh, you can do also um, obstetric ultrasound scan you know, so that you can try to assess under certain the gestational age. You can also do others like TB screening. So these are some among others uh, in terms of investigations that can be done. Then in terms of medication, uh, certain medication, of course, so these are things I've talked about. So in terms of medications, there are certain medications or treatment that may be given to this particular woman. For example, uh, for preventive measures in terms of malaria, you can put the woman on, um, of course, fancy sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. You can put this woman on Fancida to prevent malaria, but mainly the dose should start in the second trimester because Fancida is not safe for the first three months. That's why in the first three months, if the woman presents with uh, malaria, then you treat the woman with uh, a tesunet, even if it's not uh, complicated malaria. Then, of course, apart from uh, that, the woman can also be put uh, on art if the woman is on art, uh, together with septrin, of course, so that the immune system is also boosted. Apart from that, the woman should also be given tetanus toxoid doses. And you need to know that a woman should have at least five doses of TT. So if you don't have five doses of TT, it means that when you are pregnant, the first dose of tetanus toxoid will be given on first contact. The second dose is given at uh, four weeks, meaning at one month of your pregnancy. Then the third dose will be given at 24 weeks, meaning somewhere around uh, six months. Then uh, the fourth dose should, of course, be given. Uh, the fourth and the fifth dose should be given uh, at somewhere um, uh, one year each. So in normal circumstances, as a woman, before you even become pregnant, you need to make sure that you have all these five doses of TT. But if you become pregnant, you may be forced to receive quite a handful of them uh, so that you are protected and you protect the child from tetanus as well. Uh, among other medications that they may be given to this woman during antenatal visit, also mentronindazo can be given. And this, um, I mean, not metronidazole, mebendazole can be given for deworming. And apart from that, um, you can also put the woman on daily iron, which is ferrous sulfate, as well as uh, folic acid supplements to boost the, uh, the HB. Uh, so these are some of the medications that can be given. But of course, if the woman is HIV positive, you also put them on ARVs. Then in terms of referrals, advice can be given if this woman may require any referrals based on the condition or uh, status that they present with. But in terms of advice or IEC, this is also given during the antenatal visit. So the IEC, mainly it is in relation to the nutrition while the woman is pregnant, the hygiene while the woman is pregnant. You give them IEC on danger signs uh, in pregnancy. You give them IEC in terms of the minor disorders that may be seen in pregnancy. Uh, you give them IEC in terms of uh, birth preparedness and complication preparedness as well. You give them IEC in terms of how to 
uh, react to when they have malaria in pregnancy. You can talk about also prevention of uh, mother-to-child transmission, uh, importance of antenatal care. All these IEC points needs to be given. You can tell them about signs of true labor so that when they feel them or experience them, they rush to the nearest health facility. Family planning should be given, the IEC should be given at this point because uh, you want to make sure that after they deliver this child, they should have ample time for involution to take place before they become pregnant for another child. Also to allow the child once it is born to grow before they have another child. Then apart from that, uh, you talk about birth registration, child immunization, uh, sexual relations as well in terms of uh, coitus and also ensuring that they have safer sex. There are many other points that you can give them, including use of um, as, uh, IEs in terms of using uh, harmful substances that may affect the pregnancy. Uh, rest and activity itself, they need to be exercising, suitable clothing, medications, follow-ups. All this IEC information needs to be given uh, every time this woman is coming for their antenatal visits. Then, of course, the last portion of antenatal care that is done, you know, the last activity that is done is recording of your, of your findings themselves. So in this particular moment, you need to make sure that you record and enter all the information that is gathered and the care that is provided on uh, on this particular woman and you record this on the antenatal card also on the self mother would uh, register so basically these are the activities that are done during uh, antenatal care visit so till next time thank you so much for taking time to go through today's session goodbye